Well, John, um, we, we, we're into the 80s now, and I think you joined forces with David Kellett and Bernard Lewis on Vengeance. Vengeance, yeah. And they uh, did a Hobart on Vengeance. Yeah, that was 1984. That was another big, bad year. Mm. Big, bad year. In fact, uh, in some ways, it was worse than 1998. Um, uh, we, what, 19... 1998, we had, what, a 40% uh, retirement rate, whereas in 1984, we had a 70% retirement rate, uh, from memory, if memory serves. Uh, might have been, you know, 1% either way, but um, it was a, it could have been as bad as 98. Uh, I don't know why it wasn't. Perhaps the boats were better built then. I don't, I don't know. I, I never saw the boat building as being a contributor in any major way to the 98 disaster, but um, we had, out of 152 starters in 1984, we had, 100, I think it was 100 plus retirements, you know, which was huge. Um, and you were second to finish on Vengeance? We were second to finish. Oh, I didn't take a lot of part in it. I was navigating, but I, the first night out, I fell down the main hatch when I was just about to go below, and the boat fell off a wave, and I already airborne, and then went all the way down and met the boat as it came up, and uh, sprained an ankle rather badly, and ended up spending most of the race in a bunk, right. <laughs> uh, and climbing out to do a bit of navigation now and again. I think the thing about that race was it started in a strong southerly, mm -hmm. as opposed to '98. They got we got almost a gay boat island, and then the southerly yeah. came in. Yeah. So yeah. in '84, a lot of boats had a chance to turn around early. I guess. Yeah, exactly. And that's probably one of the factors. There. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But um, he was another colourful owner, Bernard Lewis. Bernard was, yeah, very much so, yeah. 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 He, he wasn't so much of a sailor as Crichton Brown was or no. some of the guys later. He, he was a bit more like Jack Rooklyn in, in, in that sense, but uh, he was a, definitely a character. Yeah. And, uh, well, Jack's another guy you sailed with, of course, on Ballyhoo. I forgot yeah, about that. Yeah, yes. tell us about that, <laughs> that experience. I don't know if we've got time, have we? We'd need, a, we'd need about another hour and a half. Yeah. But Jack uh, thought he could sail. And Jack he probably, could. being fair, he couldn't sail that well. No. I mean, that's a fair comment, isn't fair it? Fair comment, yeah. Yes. But he thought yeah. he could. But what he do, he, he surrounded himself with all the best guys that could sail, and, uh, and you know, the boats ran pretty well yeah. as a result. Um, you did the trans back on Ballyhoo? Yeah. That, that's yeah. how I first got onto it. I, yeah. I'd known Mickleborough for years, of mm. course, but uh, I, I was actually on my way to a Canadian Air Force reunion, and I got on this 707 bound for Los Angeles and run in. The first, first people I see when I step on board is Mickleborough, um, Ramo, and Peter Hankin, and they all said, what are you doing here? And I said, what are you doing here? <laughs> anyway, they were on their way to join Ballyhoo for the Transpac, and Mick O'Brien said, well, you'd better come with us. I said, I can't, Don, I'm going to an Air Force reunion, but if you, if you knew Don Mick O'Brien, there was just no way he was going to give up when he decided on something. So the next thing I found myself on Ballyhoo heading for Honolulu, uh, and that was the beginning of, uh, what, three years with Ballyhoo, Apollo, and then uh, a few years later on the, the, the Gurkha and the new Apollo. I had a couple of years on that as well. Yeah, and you had a lot of success, didn't you, with Ballyhoo and Apollo? And Ballyhoo, uh, as I said, I stepped on Ballyhoo for the Transpac and I stayed on it for three years. And, and Were you the navigating or was Stan navigating? Stan was navigating. Yeah, yeah I was working my way up from Boom Bang, basically. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, I think one year there, we never lost a race we went in. Uh, on, on line honours, and that was up against, uh, and handicap, and that was up against, you know, iconic boats like Kia Loa and Windward Passage mm. and what have you. We had a wonderful series uh, with them. Um, and the parties after the races were legendary. Oh, legendary, yeah. <laughs> Get together with those Kia Loa and Windward Passage crews. We, we had a race series off Los Angeles, the Cal Cup, and we beat Kia Loa 3 0, I think it was. and. Um, and the after, after the series party was held at uh, John Kilroy's, John John Kilroy's house down in Seal Beach. And uh, we all got on a bus and went down there and it was one of those closed communities where you had to get in past the security to get into the place. And, and then we got into the house and it was a huge house right on the beach. And I thought, gee, this guy's got this fantastic stereo set. The music was incredible. And we walked through the house to where the party was out on the big patio on the beach. And I look up and there's a 14 piece mariachi band up on the balcony. That's why the music was so good. And they had two boats, two catamarans down on the beach, and the Kealoa and Ballyhoo crew had to race each other out around boys and back. And, uh, and there was more grog, you could, food that you can shake a stick at. Yeah. Incredible party. Went on all day.
Yes, they're sadly a thing of the past, I think, these days. Well, I, I don't know. I, I thought they were too, but then I, I started doing King's Cups in, in what, 2005. And, uh, well, I did one in 90. No, 92, I did the first one. And they were some of the best parties I've ever been on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're unbelievable parties. That they used to, they're all sponsored, of course. Yeah. But the first, first King's Cup I did, we went ashore in um, Nihan Bay, and there was a beautiful resort hotel there. And this was a party for the crew, crews, plural. And uh, as you walked in, a, a beautiful Thai girl would hand you a, a champagne glass with a ribbon around it that you hang around your neck. And there was about another 20 or 30 beautiful Thai girls going around with bottles of Cordon Rouge champagne, just kept your glass filled. And this was supposed to be a cocktail party from 6 till 7 or something like that. We left at 11. And, uh, you know, when my wife dragged me out of there because I was getting probably a bit unruly at that stage, as long, along with other people. Uh, and it was still going strong, and the champagne was still being poured, and there were these beautiful girls going around with these trays of beautiful food. It was unbelievable. I don't know what it cost them, but it must have been a fortune. Yeah, exactly. you imagine, imagine about 200 yachties let loose with no, free champagne no, and no, free beer no. and free food, no. and surrounded by about 40 or 50 beautiful yeah, Thai girls. <laughs> But, uh, okay, let's get back to Sovereign in 87. Um, yeah. You were aboard when they, you took the double, the Lion Oz and Handicap? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that must have been that was a, that was highlight a highlight of a career. That was a highlight, yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. That was the highlight of my sailing, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, certainly the highlight. The, the other highlights were all the, King, all the um, uh, Clipper Cup, um, uh, what was the other sponsor there? Uh, Pan Am. The Pan Am, Pan Am Cup, Clipper Cup yeah. in Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah. three of those. and. Uh, and the other highlight, which you'd remember, was the uh, what, 2001 America's Cup Jubilee Regatta in yes, Cows. Yes, yeah, That was, was the best regatta yeah, I've ever been in. Yeah, yeah, it was wonderful, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. But getting back to Sovereign, I mean, Vernon obviously owned the boat, but Dave Kellett ran the, yep. the ship for him and uh, put together a very formidable crew and yep. uh, yeah, took the double. Well, there a lot of Hobarts on that boat. Yeah, mm. a lot of characters too, mm. led by Cable and Body <laughs> O'Donnell and Sidey Hammond, who are certainly yeah. no longer with us. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, John, you've landed what I would call the ultimate junket in as much as that you somehow became on the committee for the world sailing speed records. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that took you around the world just pushing yeah. the clock and saying this bloke goes there and he yeah. finished there. And well, so that, it, yeah, that, you that, flew... That, First class, stayed at the best hotels in Paris, well, just to take the time. Just tell us a bit about this junket. That was almost <laughs> true. I mean, uh, certainly never sailed, flew first class on, on, on the councils. It was, I, so I flew first class because I was a kind of first class oh, okay. on rebated fares, but um, uh, certainly I would never have got first class on the committees. <laughs> Uh, recognisance, but um, but in serious, how did that all come about? I mean, it must have been a fascinating thing to do. Yeah, it, it was and still is. Uh, it it came out of Jack Christophson. Remember, Jack Christophson was going going to go around the world, and uh, was it I, mid nineties or uh, ninety nine. Uh, 99, 2000. Right, okay. I think he was going in, in Christmas, December 99. I and think he was right. setting out from Sydney, wasn't he? Setting out yeah. from Sydney, and I helped him build the boat. Yeah, uh, over about six months. And uh, and he required because he was going to he was in those days you could he was going to apply for being the oldest guy to ever sail around the world, uh, which the, the the world council in those days recognised things like that. They gave it up when uh, they said no. We all we should do is just recognise the fastest. We should stop this youngest and oldest stuff because it's getting ridiculous. Such was when. 15 year olds wanted to sail around the world and, and we didn't want any part of that. But in those days they did recognise something like the oldest, so Jack Gustafsson applied to do that record. And, uh, and because I was helping him uh, quite incongruously they asked me to be the, the commissioner of record which verified the time he set out and the time he came back. And uh, so I did that, um, but he didn't he didn't finish, as you know. He, he went out and got injured and, and had a few leaks and came back, and he never, never did get to finish it because uh, he, uh, he took him so long to get over his injury. He was definitely too old. But, uh, but then they asked me to go on the council because there was a lot of records 
being done in Australia and the South Pacific at the time, and they felt they needed a representative on the council, uh, which also meant they could call on me to do all this uh, and make sure that it was all above board. And, and the council had formed out of that, that round the world, I think it was the Daily Express round the world race when they had people pre pretending to be going around the world and just sailing around the Atlantic. And that's how the council came into being. They said, somebody's got to keep an eye on this, it's getting ridiculous. So they formed the council in England and uh, uh, to, to verify all record attempts, whether it be flat out speed or round the world or passage races, passages, just transatlantic passages, things like that, uh, to verify them and they'd get somebody as a commissioner of record to verify the starts and finishes uh, or the flat out speeds or whatever. And it was fairly got fairly technical. Um, and then as the years went by, they said, well, we've got to get more technical about this and we're going to give away all these youngest and oldest and stuff. And they did that. And, uh, and I became the Australian rep on it. And over the 2000 to about, oh, I'd say about 2012, there are a lot of Australian taking part in that, around the world, uh, flat out speed. I mean, uh, Macquarie Innovation, which was the uh, derivative of Yellow Pages. Yellow Pages set the world speed record, uh, Catamaran. And Macquarie Innovation was their team as it went forward, the new sponsor. And they kept trying for years to break their own speed record, which held for about oh, 12 years from memory. I can't, that may not be right, but it held for a long, long time. And uh, they were always, every year they'd set up camp down in Victoria and have another go at it. There was also round Australia attempts. There was Trans Tasman. There was round the world from Australia. There was round Australia. Everyone was always, every two or three years, somebody'd want to do around Australia. So you oversaw all those. I oversaw all those. Yeah. 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 And then um, I didn't under oversee the Macquarie Innovation one in the Victoria. We had a special guy for to do that. Uh, but I was a representative on the council, so I used to go to the count annual council meetings in wherever they were held in England or France Paris, or yeah. Paris or New York. <laughs> <laughs> you still on the council? I still am. Yeah, I tried to retire uh, at the last, at the meeting this year, and they they conned me out of it somehow. I'm still there, but uh, still still looking for a uh, replacement right. if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> I might be. But also, um, after the I think it's fair to say, and correct me if I'm wrong, after the disastrous '98 Hobart race, um, the CYC put in place a, a safety committee or uh, what, did they, what did they call it? Uh, emergency management. Emergency management. Uh, you headed that up or you still yeah. head that up? No, yeah. no, I did you at did the time. You did long while, didn't you? Yeah, I did yeah. at the time. I took over in 99. I was, uh, it came about at the, uh, I'm not sure how it came about. It was Peter Bush who put me into it, but he was giving evidence at the, at the coroner's inquiry into the 98 and uh, he was being badgered by the uh, coroner's council and about how they what, what we'd done to improve it and Peter said well we've, we've got this very experienced guy who's going to take over as the emergency manager for the CYC and uh, uh, I thought oh that's a no wonder who that is <laughs> it turned out to be me right. uh, so I ended up uh, writing the emergency management plan which Peter Bush had already written but it was very corporate and I just changed it to be more ocean race specific. Um, and I wrote standing operating procedures and I trained a, a team and uh, we, I, did, I led that for about up until 09 I think it was and then I retired and gave over to someone else and then I got, or 08 I think it was, and then I got dragged back after, um, after uh, PwC hit Flinders Islet and uh, we had the inquiry and it all we got they said, well, we've got to have an emergency management team for this, that, and the other thing. And next thing I found myself back running it for another year or two. And I think my last one was 11. Mm. Uh, and then I got sneaky. Then I got cagey. I ran a big simulated emergency program and got a lot of experienced guys in. Everyone wanted to be in it. And, um, but what it did was identify about three good leaders, and I said, "Right, you guys are it now," yeah. and uh, and they they took over. So fortunately, it hasn't have to be implemented very. Hasn't much been implemented ever since, but it'll happen. Yeah, it yeah, will happen. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, a question I ask all the people we've, we've done these mm -hmm. interviews: how, how do you see the sport today, ocean racing, 
you know, you've been through the generations of from the yeah. 70s to now. Where, where do you see the sport? Uh, I see it as having followed a, a natural progression. I think, I don't think anything out of the ordinary has occurred. I mean, you get little deviations out, you know, canting keels and things like that, but that's all part of the development of the technology and, and, and I see that as more or less a straight line graph over the years. It's been incremental over my time. I mean, I was in the sport for 40 years and I, I thought the technology increased pretty much the way aviation does, mm -hmm. incrementally. And um, I, I see that as having occurred and still occurring. What I do think is that the crews are better trained these days. We sort of learned the hard way, you know, you stepped off a dinghy and onto an ocean racer and you learned on the, on the, on the, uh, on the job, so to speak, as you would remember. Mm -hmm. um, there was no training courses, there were no safety courses, there, were, there was nothing. Um, and you learned the hard way, um, as everybody did, including the skippers and the, the people running the race. It's a whole sport, sort of learned the hard way. And I, I see that as, changed in the last, since 98 basically, uh, there's a lot more attention given to training, uh, to experience on board, uh, the requirements of the crews going to Hobart, not just to Hobart but just doing 90 miles. I mean, you know, back in my, in the 80s you'd have big fleets going to Hobart. I mean, my big year 86, 84 I should say, mm -hmm. was my first year as Commodore, we had over 150 boats. Mm -hmm. um, but you could safely say that about 40 or 50 of those shouldn't have been there. I mean, in those days, you'd get guys doing short ocean races around and, and 40 footers around the, the harbour and say, oh, I think I might do a Hobart race, have, never having done one and none of their crew having done one. And, and the, the safety inspections were, were rigid in those days, but probably didn't go far enough. And you'd get these guys setting up to Hobart without the faintest idea what they were in for. That doesn't happen anymore. And uh, the boats are more rigorously inspected. The crews are better trained. I think they're more professional than we ever were. Um, by far, even when they're not professionals. But then there's more professionals on there too. I mean, all through, yeah, yeah all, all through the fleet. Mm. When that fleet goes out the heads, 100 or so boats, they're all pretty experienced guys and very well trained. And you know, there's always going to be a few beginners. Uh, but those beginners aren't beginners and off, off going out the heads. They've been out the heads many times and done long ocean races, 90 milers and you know, two island races, things like that. And uh, these days, you sailing much at all? Or? No, I uh, I had a long trip on the Queen Mary, uh, if you count that. Um, that was, uh, I actually even got up on the bridge. No, I didn't. No, that was the Queen Elizabeth. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I don't sail. I sail Friday night twilights, and uh, I used to do Wednesday races, but I found it a bit too tame, and I, right. uh, I don't do that anymore. Um, I just go with Bruce Gould and Margaret Rental every Friday night yeah. when he goes, which isn't every Friday yeah. night. But. Yeah. Well, John, um, your contribution to the club has been enormous, not only as Commodore, but in your roles of safety and what have you, so in publications. So thank you for your time. Um, in finishing, I'll just cast you back to when you joined the club. I must say I was privileged to second your nomination. Were you? Cable was the proposer and I was your seconder. So it's been a long friendship, and uh, so here I'd we are today. I'd forgotten you. Well, there you go, so I think you still owe me a beer. But anyway, well done, and uh, thanks for your time today, John. You're welcome.